Norman Jaker. Welcome to Melbourne Museum and the 2022 Museum Lecture Series. My fellow speakers and I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands where we work, the Wurundjeri and Boon Wurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation and First Peoples language groups and communities across Victoria and Australia. We pay our deep respects to Elders past, present and emerging and also acknowledge we are guests on country. Welcome to all of you here and our live audience at Melbourne Museum and welcome also to those joining us via the live stream. If you have any questions for our speakers, there will be roving microphones for our live audience, or please submit your questions through the online Q&A option, and these will be addressed at the end of the session. I'm Marianne McCubbin, Head of Strategic Collection Management at Museums Victoria. I'm delighted to be hosting this, event, this evening's lecture and would also like to acknowledge my colleagues, Kate Phillips and Dr. Moya McFadgen from the Natural Sciences and the History and Technology Departments, respectively, who are convening the 2022 lecture series. The museum lecture series seeks to connect the public with the, the important and wide ranging research work of museum staff and its collaborators, and to showcase our collections and collection work which in turn inspire and facilitate inquiry into some of our region's key contemporary and historical questions. Tonight's lecture, Playing It Safe, Managing Hazardous Substances in the Museum's Collections, aims to provide an insight into how collection managers, conservators and preparators identify, test and manage hazardous substances in our diverse collections in order to protect everyone from potential health and safety risks. You will hear from some of our most experienced staff members in this field about the development of our comprehensive framework of practice. We will then have time for audience questions from the floor and from the live stream audience. So please post questions during the session using the Q&A button. One caveat to the questions though, while we are very happy to share our framework with you, we're unable to provide specific or individual advice to audience members about protecting themselves from any potential risks posed by items or collections that they themselves might hold. I'll commence with an overview of the framework the museum has developed to protect people when they work with or otherwise encounter items in the collections that contain hazardous substances. Museums Victoria holds estate collections under the Museums Act 1983. Developed over more than 160 years, the collections consist, consist of some 17 million items. That is an estimate. We haven't counted them. They include one of the most internationally significant collections of First Peoples cultural material from southeastern and wider Australia and the, the Pacific, extensive scientific holdings with strengths in material from southeastern Australia and surrounding waters, and a unique collection representing Victoria's key historical, social and technological moments and developments. <laughs> a small minority of the collections contain hazardous substances. The substances may either be inherent in the makeup of the items, for example, asbestos bearing minerals or old medical equipment that contains mercury, or due to historic treatments of the items in the museum. For example, pesticide treatments containing heavy metals, which have been applied historically to mounted specimens in the collection. However, because the collections are so varied, when added together, they contain a significant array of hazardous substances. This level of variation would also be common to smaller collections with a very mixed bag of types of items. So many museums, large and small, are needing to develop frameworks to reduce the risks and improve safety. 
Victorian Occupational Health and Safety Law says employers must eliminate risks to health and safety, including hazardous substances, so far as is reasonably practicable. And if it is not reasonably practicable to eliminate risks to health and safety, to reduce those risks so far as is reasonably practicable. The museum has also necessarily heeded many associated laws, compliance requirements and other guiding contexts. But we have needed to be inventive and proactive in developing our framework to fit museum collections and their range of nuances. Our program has been informed by key health and safety management mandates. The first is the ongoing cycle for managing health and safety hazards and risks. The second, which is a staged element of the first, is to apply the health and safety hierarchy of controls to manage the risk, so far as is reasonably practicable. Critically, the control of eliminating the hazard in this instance, eliminating the hazardous substance, affords the highest and most reliable level of protection. And yet elimination of items that contain hazards runs counter to museum intentions to retain and preserve collections in perpetuity. Yet the museum has eliminated collection items insofar as we have deaccessioned items deaccessioning be where, being where we formally remove items from the collection and dispose of them. We've done this where items fit our collection deaccession policy criterion that the item presents either an occupational health and safety risk or a risk to other items that is best remedied by deaccession. However, mostly we don't deaccession items because we want to keep them and we can find a safe way to manage and present them. We've also removed the hazardous substance from some of our some items in our collections where that has been possible and where the benefit of doing so has been seen as worth the cost. And Steve will also talk about other forms of elimination. However, most hazardous substances cannot be removed from collection items. For example, the heavy metal pesticide treatments historically applied to mounted specimens cannot be cleaned off the items. They are embedded in the skins, fur and bones of the animals. The health and safety management cycle and all its stages requires consultation. With health and safety representatives, this is mandated legislation and the people who do the work. And those same staff have developed the museum's framework. Many museum staff have made enormous contributions to developing and, and enacting our framework, and I'd really like to acknowledge all their efforts, which have been truly astounding. And it's my pleasure to introduce my fellow speakers, Dr. Rosemary Goodall, the museum's materials scientist, will speak of her foundational work in identifying hazardous substances in the museum's collections and her role in assessing the risks. The Australian Institute for the Conservation of Cultural Materials recently awarded Rosemary the 2021 Colin Pearson Outstanding Research in the Field of Material Conservation Award for her research work here. Second, I'd like to introduce Stephen Sparry, the museum's head of preparation. Stephen has played a long-standing crucial role in assessing the risks and developing controls at all levels, particularly in relation to the types of collection items that preparators generally handle. Thirdly, I'd like to introduce Alice Cannon, the museum's manager of the history and technology collections. As the manager of a material diverse, materially diverse collection, Alice has played a key role in developing and applying controls for a range of hazardous substances, 
but tonight Alice will focus on the safe management of lead-based items in the collection. Finally, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth McCartney, the museum's manager of conservation, who has played an important role across all stages of the risk management cycle and at all levels of control but who will tonight focus on the museum's safe management of pharmaceuticals and other drugs in the collection. And it's now my pleasure to welcome Rosemary to speak. Thank you, Marianne. My main aim when I came to the museum was to implement a testing program designed to identify hazardous substances in our collection. The large number of items in modern museum collections makes it impractical well, to test every item. Museum's Victoria testing program was designed to overcome the problem by surveying in a semi-random selection of collection items. We developed protocols to ensure the survey, though limited in the number of items tested and in the time taken, still covered all the different types of objects in our collection. The testing program implemented the use of proven, reliable, non-destructive testing methodology to identify inorganic, organic, and other types of hazardous substances. The program then documented the identification of the hazardous substances in our museum database. And we applied a physical label to each item where hazards are identified. This has significantly extended the museum's body of knowledge about specific hazards within the collection. Although the number of items identified with hazards in the collection is a small percentage of the total, the range of materials is very extensive and often many substances are incorporated in one single object. To detect all these, we need different types of analysis techniques. Being part of a museum, they must be non-destructive techniques. We use a handheld portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometer or XRF as the main analysis type for inorganic materials such as lead and arsenic in mounted specimens. I also utilize infrared spectroscopy with a transportable Fourier transform infrared spectrometer or FTIR to identify materials such as pharmaceuticals, poisons, photographic chemicals, cellulose nitrate and cellulose acetate, plastics, PCBs, naphthalene and other insecticides. I also use colorimetry and access other types of analysis as required, including renting gas monitors and, ex and using external analysis. For example, when asbestos analysis is required, we use a NATA accredited laboratory to comply with legal requirements of analysis. Hazardous substances are part of the makeup of many items, particularly material manufactured over the last 200 years. I used XRF to identify the paints used on these delightful Indian figurines from the late 1800s. The white paint is lead-based. The bright red is a mercury-based, uh, mercury sulfide-based vermilion, and the yellow and brown paints contain arsenic most likely in the form of orpiment, a natural arsenic sulfide. Lead paint particularly was used extensively throughout the 19th and 20th century. So our collections have many items requiring testing for lead. Pharmaceuticals in the collection come in many forms from early apothecary jars to sealed vials and sheets of tablets. The nature of these has been in question for some time, but an extensive survey of the collection and testing of these items has allowed us to confirm the contents. When the doctor's, this doctor's travelling kit first came to conservation, a white powder covered many of the surfaces. A combination of XRF and FTIR analysis was used to identify the white powder as mercury chloride which was a common compound used in 19th century medicine. 
This was then carefully cleaned before the chest could be handled by our collection managers and stored. We have also utilised the facilities at the Australian Synchrotron to identify some of our poisons, if some of our poisons are still active, and to clarify the makeup of pharmaceutical mixtures. We looked at the tips on some poison darts in the collection and were able to confirm that the active ingredient was still present in the dried tip, making these small darts still lethal weapons. Our testing program is ongoing. We are still carrying out surveying in some sections of the collection. However, most of the testing I carry out now is done prior to conservation or um, preparatory work to identify items used in the collection or to, for items being sent out on loan. In the case of mounted specimens, which are known to have been treated with arsenic and mercury-based pesticides, they are tested prior to any work on in any um, performed in any way. By identifying if the hazardous substances on an item before it is handled, we can alert our staff and collaborators to ensure that the items are handled according to our safe handling procedures. For example, these three items came into the laboratory for testing by XRF. Um, the hat was tested using XRF, and I confirmed that it had been uh, felted using mercury nitrate. The eggs, on the other hand, which were sometimes treated with mercury chloride to prevent mould, were found to be free of heavy metals. And the eagle was tested and found to have been treated with arsenic soap during its preparation. We also utilise other equipment for other hazards, such as radiation in the collection. We're fortunate that we have a relatively small number of items in this category. These are items such as radium painted watch dials and aviation dials, some scientific equipment, geological specimens, and decorative items such as this cake stand made from uranium glass. We have sensitive equipment such as a Geiger counter and a dosimeter to detect the, the radiation, but a simple test for uranium glass is to shine a UV lamp on it and it will fluoresce green as in the second image here. Our hazard testing will continue as required as we aim to extend Museum Victoria's body of knowledge about our science, specific hazardous substances in our collection. I'll now pass over to Steve, thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Stephen Sparry. Um, there I am, actually it's not me. Uh, I'm the manager of the preparation department and tonight I'm going to talk briefly on the hazards that we may encounter when restoring taxidermy mounts and highlight the controls that we use to reduce any potential risks to the staff that undertake this work. Before we look at where we do the restoration work though, uh, we need to understand what hazards we may encounter. Now, Rosemary's highlighted um, many of them just now, uh, but the ones that we're particularly interested in uh, are those that occur in taxidermy mounts and dry skins, uh, which were treated with chemicals to protect them from insects. And as Rosemary mentioned, things like mold. Mercuric chloride was sprayed onto fur and feathers. Arsticle soaps were rubbed into the insides of skins. Um, you can see here we've got a the recipe I don't try it at home, but because Arsticle soap, uh, which was um, apparently the, the original, um, and that was uh, created in um, 1794. Lead used in lead armatures and ear liners, as you can see, uh, it's likely to have an ear liner in this ear here, as well as asbestos uh, that was used in mache's around the eyes, ears, mouth, uh, and legs to strengthen the mount. In Australia, we can roughly identify how a mount has been treated according to its preparation date. For example, things uh, prepared prior to 1950 may contain arsenic and mercury. Those prepared prior to 1980 may contain asbestos. If the history is unknown, we consider the specimen likely to contain the above hazardous substances. Um, 
Prior to working on any specimen, uh, it will be tested, as Rosemary mentioned, with the XRF machine to help inform our next steps. There we go. So when might we encounter these hazardous substances? Well, researchers uh, will encounter them potentially in the collection when they handle uh, things like research skin studies to investigate um, things like bill lengths, wings, fur and foot pads. But my team and many others uh, will more likely encounter them during exhibition development where we are required to move and handle taxidermy mounts around the building, remove dust, repair and restore them prior to uh, them being put on display. Restoration may include anything from patching fur, cleaning fur and feathers, uh, broken and cracked ears as, as you saw earlier, re-sculpting uh, re re -sculpting facial features as you can see in some of these examples here, uh, some nightmare fuel on the left and some beautiful things on the right. Um, filling in open stitching and fixing internal structural elements. You've seen this slide before, um, but just to sort of really uh, um, put this into your minds, uh, for us, we need to reduce the potential risk associated with handling and working on taxidermy mounts containing hazardous substances. Um, we use the hierarchy of control to inform our work practices and procedures. Um, I've just highlighted there in dot points on the right-hand side, so you don't have to read everything in the middle. And I'll go through them now as part of our work practices. So the control that offers the greatest level of protection is elimination. Elimination can be seen as the deaccessioning of a specimen from the collection, as Marianne mentioned um, earlier or simply removing it from the selection pool in an upcoming exhibition. However, that is not always possible uh, as it may be an integral part of, our, of a display or have a particularly interesting story. Substitution plays a big role uh, in reducing any potential risks to staff when selecting objects for display. We can substitute a hazardous seagull mount, uh, one, excuse me, with uh, one that isn't hazardous as we have many in the collection. But when it comes to things like replacing a spare tiger mount stalking through the reeds, that's a little more difficult. And for those playing, paying close attention, uh, both of these specimens were made by a person with the surname Ward. The mounted beaver uh, was mounted by Henry Augustus Ward uh, in New York, uh, not to be confused with Henry Ward, the father of renowned taxidermist Roland Ward of London, where the tiger was mounted. Uh, and you can see that on display in a case in Children's Gallery, uh, Pauline Gamble Children's Gallery. So if we can't eliminate or substitute specimen in our upcoming exhibition, we then utilize purpose-built engineering controls to reduce the potential risk. This here is our purpose-built downdraft workshop. As mentioned earlier, there are many tasks uh, that we complete on taxidermy mounts to get them ready to get them ready for display. These tasks vary in risk level depending on the specimen, the hazards it may contain, and the application of energy required to complete the task, something I will say a lot um, through tonight. The more energy that we use to repair, move and handle the specimens, the more likely we are to generate dust containing hazardous substances. For large specimens, we utilize engineering controls such as this downdraft workshop that draws air between the staff member and a taxidermy mount and out through HEPA filters in the floor. And for much smaller amounts, we utilize a purpose-built downdraft table, which works principally the same as the downdraft workshop, uh, as well as things like fume hoods, uh, which you find in most laboratories. When moving specimens between stalls and onto display, we have made enclosed stillages uh, that ensure the rattling, uh, any rattling that may disturb any potential hazards in the um, that are contained within. And remember, I spoke to you just recently about the application of energy. Anything rattling around uh, may dislodge those um, hazards and we want to keep them locked away in there when traveling. For very large projects, uh, like that of the now deinstalled Wild Gallery, the workload is shared across many individuals, thus potentially reducing the risk to any one individual. 
we, uh, when completing restoration and conservation tasks on mounted specimens, it is more important that we note any materials and methods used. This will help inform staff in the future as to exactly what we are working with. Uh, these pre and post treatments are recorded in EMU, our, uh, our um, electronic database. Uh, work areas are clean post restoration work um, ready for the next user, but I'll let um, the next speaker talk about that. As with all things, uh, we practice good hygiene uh, to reduce risk, risk associated with these uh, potential hazards. I've seen enough of this. Oh. Last, and if you remember on the hierarchy of control, definitely least in uh, effectiveness is the use of PPE. Some tasks don't require engineering controls or isolation as they may be as simple as moving a bird mount from one shelf to another. But PPE is utilized to reduce any potential risk and offer a base level of protection to the staff member. In other cases, such as fixing the stitching on the neck and belly of a giraffe, uh, it's not reasonably practical to complete the task without it. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, next, I'll pass over to Alice. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to talk um, some more about some of our administrative controls uh, using lead as an example. Um, lead is a naturally occurring metal. It's soft, stable, malleable, and resistant to corrosion. And these are all really useful properties. And so as a result, lead has been used in nearly all areas of art and industry. It's also a toxic substance, which accumulates in the body um, if it's ingested or inhaled. Metallic lead is so soft it can leave residues on the skin when it's handled, which can then or can be inhaled or swallowed in dust particulates or as aerosols. It's been mined and used since antiquity and um, lead's toxic effects have been known since at least ancient Roman times. Accounts of its toxicity have disappeared and reappeared in the medical literature every, ever since. The Romans used heaps of lead. They used it in their wine as a sweetener and a preservative. They used it for cookware and drinking um, vessels. They used it for their currency and in water pipes. Uh, they used it so much that some authors have even suggested that uh, lead poisoning contributed to the downfall of the Roman Empire. The 20th century eventually saw lead largely removed from petrol, medicines and paints, amongst other things. Um, so if you're ever feeling down about our lack of progress in certain areas, you can at least take heart in the fact that we don't make whistles out of lead anymore, like the one on the screen. So we heard from Rosemary um, that uh, a lot of the work we do is to identify where hazards are uh, in the collection so we can reduce the risk of exposure to people. So I'll first show you some more examples of where we find lead in the collection and then how we manage this risk. So I'm from his, the historical, sorry, the history and technology collection, but I did just want to note quickly that um, we also have uh, many lead uh, bearing minerals, often very beautiful ones in our sciences collection, such as those on screen. All right, here's a, a small selection. Uh, lead's been used to make everything from lead toys and figurines, like that little bunny rabbit, to coins and medals, fishing sinkers, pipes and plumbing fixtures, printing type, pewter tableware and lead shot. And that little brooch up in the top um, is actually, it incorporates a, a Turkish bullet that was removed from a soldier's wound and the soldier fought at Gallipoli. It can also be found in scientific and medical equipment, such as those X-ray plates you can see on the screen, in solder and as an electrode in batteries. This is just another very cool object I couldn't resist showing you. It's um, a section of undersea pipeline that was installed in the English Channel and used to supply fuel to the Allies uh, during World War II, just beginning a few months after D-Day until the end of the hostilities. And you can see in the labelled um, picture all of the different materials that have been used to make it, but with a lead pipe at, at the core. We're probably all most familiar with lead as a component of paint. And these are just some examples of lead-based pigments that we have in the collection. Lead compounds are also found in printing inks, in glazes and in lead glass, uh, horrifyingly in historic cosmetics, 
um, and as a drying agent in adhesives, rubber and plastics. We found lead in the paint used on lots of our very big things. Just two examples here. Um, the first steam locomotive built in the Newport Railway Yards and on this truck that belonged to Harry Johns, who was a mid 20th century boxing and wrestling entrepreneur who toured the country in his van. Um, we've also found it in a number of the paints used on this beautiful model carousel. Um, it's actually on display at the moment in our mini mega model museum exhibition, which is upstairs if you want to get a closer look at it. Um, as is this amazing scale model of a 19th century quartz mine in Clunes, where again, we found lead in many of the paints used um, on the figurines and on the parts. Um, and we also found lead had been used to make many of the figurines themselves. So some little bullocks and people um, made of lead and they were x-rays taken during a previous conservation treatment. One common object that doesn't contain lead uh, is a lead pencils. Um, so the lead of a lead pencil is made of graphite, which is a form of carbon, though lead and various other metal alloys have been used as a drawing and writing medium in the past. And one reason for why lead pencils got their name is because when graphite um, first um, was discovered, it was called black lead. But depending on the age of the pencil, um, the paint used on the outside is more likely to contain lead. So on to some of our administrative controls. I know this is not an exciting slide. It's a screenshot of our uh, a tab on our collection management uh, our collection database. Um, and it's where we add details about suspected and confirmed hazardous substances to object records. And when we do that, it triggers that H triangle H symbol, um, which you can see up in the top right <laughs> of, um, of the screenshot. And that shows wherever you are in, in the record. So it's a, just a visual trigger that you need to go and look at the materials information to see what hazardous uh, substances are there and therefore which safe handling procedures and PPE you should um, consider before you go and look at the object. We also need to label the object itself. And this is just an example of what we use on screen. So it has space to record brief details about the hazard that's either suspected or confirmed. And again, a yellow sticker as a visual alert. Um, we may also label storage cabinets and storage enclosures so that um, before you open a cabinet or a box, you're aware that hazardous, hazardous materials are present. And a really important part of our management um, controls is uh, running training programs and store inductions for new staff and contractors who are coming in to work in these spaces. So um, skin contact is the main hazard we need to consider when we're handling most of the lead objects in our collection. So we want to avoid getting lead on our hands, which we then might transfer to our eyes or our mouth and ingest. It's all sounding very familiar from the last two years. It's the same principle. And so um, simply wearing gloves is usually um, adequate protection in the majority of cases. <clears throat> Um, if there's dust associated with the objects, and we have found this, for example, with um, lead type that we have in the collection, or possibly some of our powdering paints, we would also wear a P2 mask, again, something very familiar for us all from the last couple of years. And on occasion, uh, we might also wear a half face respirator, um, which they just have finer, um, finer, uh, what do you call them, filters, and they're more close fitting. Um, and then on occasion, we might also uh, work in a fume cupboard um, like you saw in Steve's talk. And just lastly, we uh, need to think about cleaning up because lead soft, it can also leave residues on the surfaces where we're working, which we could touch again later. So we make sure to clean our work surface down, often using this material, uh, this substance D-wipe, which is uh, very good at removing heavy metals from surfaces. And then we dispose of all of that cleaning, contaminated cleaning material into specialist hazardous waste bins. So it's not a really exciting spot to leave, leave my talk, but that's me. So I will hand over now to Lizzie.
Thank you, Alice. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth McCartney and I'm the manager of the Conservation Department at Museums Victoria. I'm going to talk to you about another category of objects that we collect that tell a fascinating story of the development of a profession and now also present us with a potentially hazardous material related storage and access challenge. This is our collection of pharmaceutical products. After the past few years of the pandemic, we have all become keen observers of the brilliance of medical research and the important role that pharmaceutical products can play in our lives. As with other categories of objects already discussed, however, the history of pharmaceutical products and the materials from which they were made does involve some materials that we now know to be hazardous to human health. Historic pharmaceuticals and museums are often a complex mixture of substances, each medical set unique and reflecting the medical practices of their time. The collection of pharmaceutical items at Museum Victoria is no different. But while the historical and material record is incredibly important for us to keep, we must also look after those now working with and accessing these objects. Another layer of complexity to be considered when working with pharmaceuticals is that some of these items are scheduled substances and some are covered by dangerous goods regulations. All medicines and poisons in Australia are categorised by how freely they are made available to the public. This system is called scheduling. Each category has different rules for how a medicine or poison should be labelled, sold, bought, stored and thrown away. And these scheduled substances and dangerous goods rules apply to us as a museum just as much as they apply to your local pharmacy. With this in mind, we undertook a survey and audit of our pharmaceuticals collection to gain a better understanding of exactly what material was there. For before you can work out how best to manage something, you need to know what that something is. The survey and audit was a multi-departmental effort that included Google searches, schedule and dangerous goods identification, safety data sheet review, and in some instances, materials analysis in-house by Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, or FTIR, and X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy, or XRF. The analysis work carried out by um, our materials scientist, Dr. Rosemary Goodall, was invaluable as the information provided on the outside of bottles or packets from 100 or so, or so years ago doesn't always give you a completely clear picture of what you might find inside. Sometimes materials analysis was the only way to correctly identify the contents. To illustrate a little more about this process, I'm going to talk about two pharmaceutical products found inside one rather lovely object, this medicine chest. This medicine chest is estimated to have been in use from 1850 to the early years of the 20th century but when it was acquired, we were given very little other information about it beyond the fact that the original donor told us it was once used by a sea surgeon. The chest houses 48 bottles, packets and vials containing a range of medicines, some labelled and some not, plus medical equipment and bandages. The condition of many items within the chest and the number of missing or incomplete, incomplete labels made it difficult to assess the hazardous nature of the substances within. We analysed them with our FTIR and XRF, but samples from two items appeared to contain mixed compounds. To determine the individual components, they were further analysed by microinfrared spectroscopy at the infrared beamline at the Australian Synchrotron. And I do recommend if they ever have an open day going, it's a really, really fun place to visit. Um, one of the samples we took to the Australian Synchrotron was from this object. And yes, if you're able to read the label, you did read it correctly. This is dragon's blood. Dragon's blood is a term used to describe resins from a variety of plant species. The bright red resin was highly prized as a dye, pigment, and for medical use. Its medical uses include respiratory and gastrointestinal treatments, and in some cases, as an anticoagulant for healing topical ulcers. This sample contained a mixture of different grains. Examination under a microscope showed clear, orange, red, and brown-black particles. Although FTIR analysis showed that this sample matched reference samples of dragon's blood, there were also some results that did not look like dragon's blood. This, along with the lead, iron and mercury detected by the XRF, indicated the presence of other material in this sample. This prompted further investigation at the Australian Synchrotron. Oh, better. The synchrotron analysis of this sample confirmed it is a complex mixture of substances that included added extras, such as clay, red mercury sulfide and mercury nitrate. We know that the high cost of dragon's blood um, often led to its adulteration with cheaper resins and red inorganic compounds, and our testing shows that this was the case with our dragon's blood. The second sample we analysed at the Australian Synchrotron was Dover's powder. There are two examples of Dover's powder in the chest. 
Dover's powder was used to treat colds and fevers and original recipes contained equal parts of Ipecacuana and opium, both plant materials. You might know Ipecacuana as Ipecac, which was uh, used historically to induce vomiting. Um, there, the recipe was made up with either potassium sulfate or a blend of potassium nitrate and cream of tartar. Visual microscopic inspection of the particles from both samples confirmed that the material was a mixture containing, containing clear crystals of potassium sulfate, identified by our FDIR, and brown and black fragment, fragments of plant material. However, our FDIR was unable to identify the plant material. To investigate this further, a small sample was analysed by synchrotron micro-infrared spectroscopy. Three particle um, types were identified, two dark brown and one yellow. The first type of dark brown particle closely matched the reference spectrum of opium samples. The results from the second brown particle looked similar to far, uh, plant fiber spectra, making it possible that this particle is ipecac, as ipecac powder is made from a ground plant root. The spectra of the pale yellow particles in the mixture most closely resembled logwood. Logwood was a common medicinal plant used as an astringent and in the treatment of diarrhea and dysentery. So the micro-red infra infrared spectroscopy carried out at the Australian Synchrotron was instrumental in identifying the individual particles of these two mixed medicines, allowing us to correctly attribute formulations to the materials. Additives were found in both materials, substitute resins and heavy metals in the dragon's blood and logwood in the Dover's powder. These results add to the understanding of pharmaceutical practices during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, added to the provenance information for the chest, and gave us a better understanding of the hazardous compounds present. But what else could this medicine chest offer in terms of treatment options? Testing confirmed the composition of some compounds and also the common practice of container reuse in medicine chests. How about worm powder? Not made from worms, but definitely used to treat worms. Testing showed the presence of santonin in our worm powder. Oh yeah, right. Um, santonin is the active ingredient in wormwood and has been used historically for the treatment of worms. It can be found in many older medicine chests and we can now confirm we've got it in ours too. The white crystalline contents of the pairs full as earth tin were identified as borax rather than full as earth, which is a clay compound. Borax was used as an antifungal. Similarly, a large tin of mum's baking powder contained a crystalline white substance, which was a match to salicylic acid. Salicylic acid was extracted from willow bark and used before the development of acetyl salicylic acid, which we know as aspirin. So, as you can see, the extra information we uncovered through this survey and audit was incredibly important. We learnt more about our collection and added to the body of knowledge about pharmaceutical practice from the 19th and early 20th centuries, including the continuing use of early medicines, the composition of medicines in common use, the practice of extending more expensive ingredients through the use of cheaper additives, and the reuse of containers for newer medications. The identification of many hazardous and restricted compounds has also enabled us to improve our storage of these materials, some of our storage is shown in this image, and improve methods of access for our staff and our visitors. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, is this, this on? Oh, okay. Um, so thanks, thank you very much. Um, we're now happy to open it up uh, for questions to the panel, which may come from the live audience here and or the uh, people online. Yes, I'll just come down with the microphone. <laughs> With the um, pharmaceuticals, I was just wondering with, you know, things being like mislabeled and how do you sort of come to the conclusion of, you know, those boxes being reused? Like, is there any sign that the person, you know, the person using it has like remarked them or could there be like a mistake further back in the process where they've put the wrong thing in that container? Like how do you sort of make the decision of like how it got there? <laughs> 
Um, often the material looks wrong. It, it's often just a visual inspection when you you look at the um, as the salicylic acid was a, a perfect example. It should have been a fine white powder, and the salicylic acid was a crystalline, uh, a fine crystalline uh, material. Um, so yeah, it's it's really that simple. Um, we should probably say though that Rosemary is a chemist, and um, <laughs> it might be obvious to her. That's why we go and ask her all of those sorts of questions. Yes, Kate. We've got a couple of questions from our online audience. Um, one from Kate says, where does the waste go after it is placed in the hazardous waste bin? So depending what the hazardous hazards are in the waste, uh, the museum has a uh, general hazardous waste disposal program and so we can put some material in there as part of uh, our broader disposal of hazardous waste but some some hazards require very very um, specific customized forms of waste disposal and we have needed to work with companies who specialise in disposing of those forms of waste and generally um, pay for it. Do you want to add anything, Rosemary? Sorry, I think you've covered most of uh, everything, Marianne. I've got one from uh, Jenny Hansen, and she says, I work in a historic house museum and wonder who we should seek out to check out our taxidermy con taxidermy's condition and how to clean them, such as our deer heads? That's a good question. I can feel that. Um, it's, it's probably best to start by uh, emailing the Ask Us crew. Do we have, can we put link that in the chat potentially um, and go from there? Um, did you want to say something? Oh, else? I was going to add, um, uh, you could also approach a conservator. So there is an there's a Australian Association for Professional Conservators, and they have um, it's aiccm.org.au, and so you could get in contact with a private conservator and ask them to come and assess um, assess those materials. Though they might need to consult with other experts as well. Yep. So I think yeah, that hopefully that covers it. Yeah. Great. And uh, there's one more. Um, an anonymous attendee says, uh, we have a medicine chest in our collection with white powder left in some of the drawers. Labels are still on, on the lid, so we know what they contain. What do we need to do exactly? How do we clean them? I mean, I think that's one that we can't answer from afar. Um, the approach we take when we don't know what something is, is to assume it is hazardous. So, you know, all of the sorts of controls we talked about tonight, um, we would be taking and you would need to find someone who can identify it for you and then give you advice from there. So um, probably someone, a, a contractor might be a conservator or um, another sort of uh, chemical specialist is probably the best thing to do, would you say? Yeah. Um, the AICCM website that Alice mentioned previously, they have a find a conservator page and you'll be able to search in there for materials analysis, I think, or scientific. Actually, yes, I think that is a category. Yeah, I think it's a yeah. category. So you, if you need assistance with identification, you'll be able to find someone who can quote on that work for you. Uh, so, so you've already three put up their hands simultaneously. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be quick. How do you approach objects that are sealed? You know, if you and you can't access the contents without compromising the object. Do you, do you want to go, to Rosemary? I can go. Um, well, I, I think from from my point of view, I would um, research the type of object that it that it is, um, be it a pharmaceutical or um, a pigment sample or something like that, um, and just try and get a general idea of of what's in that sealed item. Um, 
and then if if we really can't find anything else out about it um, to eliminate the fact that it's hazardous, we just treat it as a hazardous material. Um, one, one of the nice things about the systems that have been developed is that we have that suspected or confirmed um, delineation. So even those tags that we put on um, the objects themselves are double-sided and one is where you write what you suspect the hazard might be and on the other side is where once Rosemary's actually tested it, she can confirm it, um, which I think is really useful and that works in the database as well. Um, so you can add you know, information that you've got from research and other sources. Um, but because the analysis techniques we've got access to are largely sort of surface ones, aren't they? Mm. You know, we would need to go outside the museum to to do any more chemical analysis. Yeah. We, we, we did anticipate that people might want further information about the various aspects of it. So we have um, actually got three slides about further information this particular database, Cameo, which I'm sure some of you would be aware of, contains a phenomenal amount of information about various um, mat materials and substances. Um, and then if we click through another, re uh, there's the AICCM uh, reference that people have already. We, we haven't. We haven't actually put the web address though. <laughs> Oops. No, <laughs> that's the Australian Institute for the Conservation of Cultural Materials. Um, so you can start there, but also um, another good place to start. So there's these are actually two very comprehensive resources and they're really aimed for specialists in museums. But this website, the Museum of London, is very good. Um, so if you've got particular items, you can click through and of course the items are going to be, it's UK obviously, but the items are going to be the same as, as what we've got in Australia more or less and you can start to get a sense of what sort of items, uh, what sort of substances, particular types of items may contain. And it's very accessible and very friendly. This is an absolute tome. I mean, it is about that thick. It's it's US, but it is actually an outstanding resource. Um, so, so, so you can also sort of start um, there. And Steve mentioned um, Ask Us. So it's an email address at the museum. If you just put ask us at museum.vic.gov.au. If you want further information or any any of this, we would be happy to give it to you. So um, you could you, you could begin with ask us. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a really fascinating and informative um, series of presentations. Do you incorporate any sort of risk assessment into your acquisition process? Do you want, do you want me to talk to that? Um, yes. So we we have uh, as part of our acquisitions process <laughs> what we call the red flag list, and they're not all hazard space. Like some, it's like, do we have good providence and all of that sort of thing. But um, you know, is there potential to have hazardous? Are there potentially hazardous substances involved is another one. And that's when we, we talk uh, closely with conservation. Um, at some point, conservation will do an assessment. We might have Rosemary do some tests to confirm if things are present or not. And then we need to have a discussion about um, whether we can safely manage those hazards if they're present. Um, you know, weighing up the costs and benefits is, you know, is the is the, the cost and the burden of managing those hazards worth worth the acquisition so um it's not quite the sort of matrix risk assessment that you might see um but that is uh embedded in our safe handling procedures that kind of um risk assessment approach in terms of the likelihood and consequences of exposure so yes and no i think is possibly <laughs> a short answer yes does that does that answer yeah hi um, I was just wondering, you alluded to a little bit before that you referenced the literature for different 
uh, maybe ways of preserving things and that kind of um, those procedures. I was just wondering, where do you start? Do you instantly go for the spectrometer? like spectroscopy or do you go to the literature to see maybe someone in the 1800s wrote a paper on how to do something to a deer head a cheeky answer is we go straight to rosemary because she's read them all <laughs> and she has the equipment um i don't know what would you say um it's a bit of a combination if if it's something fairly straightforward then you know is the lead paint on this then I would just go straight to the XRF and test it um, if you don't have an XRF then you can go to the literature and and know that pre um, 1950 then there's a very high chance that what you've got has got lead paint on it <laughs> not always but but the majority of items oh so um curators and scientists often um, are able to tell us as well like you know our engineering curators will be like oh yes you know lead paint absolutely that would yeah. have you know um, someone mentioned before and it's not incidental rosemary is um, a trained industrial chemist and that fact has been an inordinate asset for us um, in being able to know where to begin to sort of identify hazards and and begin to assess the risks. Really, it's made the absolute difference um, to our ability to um, develop a framework around this. So I was just going to ask, um, do you have any favourite items that are like no longer able to be displayed or have been destroyed or anything based on their kind of risk or things they contain? I mean, I do always feel a bit sad. We have deaccessioned in the last, you know, few years, um, uh, jars and bottles of like photographic chemicals and things like that and I just always feel a bit sad because I just really love the way they look <laughs> um but you, you've probably all seen in secondhand shops they start to go really bad and so they've just been too hazardous to keep um it's not a very good reason but I just do always mourn those ones yes yeah. Um, I, I guess um, we've also got some had some agricultural chemicals and chemicals in our economic botany collection that we've had to dispose of because the the risk of handling those items was so so great. If the jar broke, it it would be very serious illness to the people exposed. So um, that's that's been very sad to have to part with them, but much much better to do that than than risk people's health. And it's it's always a, a conundrum because we're a history of technology museum, like the history of agriculture and pesticides is part of what we're about. So, you know, they're not decisions we make lightly either. And probably in the scheme of things, we don't have to dispose of too many things. The um, risk framework that we've got and that has uh, safe handling procedures and kind of the storage solutions that we found have meant that we can continue to store and access in modified ways in some cases but still kind of access and use this collection in a way that's safe for those people who are accessing it which is I think one of the yeah the big benefits of all the work that we've done. Well most of my favorite things are taxidermy mounts um is that's what we deal with and um we don't generally deaccession too many of those so uh, they, you know, if they're not on display, then they're um, stored safely um, and protected in our, our collection. Yeah. We have um, uh, Lizzie spoke about scheduled poisons and pharmaceuticals, and we've got some scheduled eight and nine pharmaceuticals and poisons, and they're the highest level of schedule. We're not allowed to display them. Um, with our permit so we have no choice we cannot display them we we can display packaging but we can't display the substance yeah even if they're disguised you know hidden by the packaging yeah. the, the scheduled sub management of scheduled substances is fascinating and not something i ever thought i would have to uh, do in my career um uh 
we've had a few exhibition uh, loan requests, you know, exhibitions around the 60s. We've had a few people want to borrow our, you know, original 1960s packet of the contraceptive pill, um, which you wouldn't think there's much that's fine, you know, it's a familiar object, but it's it's a Schedule 4, it's a, it's a um, prescription-only drug. So we can't lend it unless um, the borrowing institution also has... Um, a poisons permit and can demonstrate that they uh, have systems in place to manage it, which feels really weird, but that's just the way it is. Oh uh, yeah, this is sorry, I have a microphone now. Um, before Museums Victoria had Rosemary or had a materials scientist, what was what did the framework work look like then? Uh, very different. <laughs> <laughs> very different. Uh, how long have you been at the museum for, Rosemary? 11 years, yeah, yeah. So we started to look at this stuff um, seriously about 15 years ago, but it's also true that um, conservators were really the most educated staff prior to Rosemary coming on um, about, about uh, all these hazards, and it was conservators who started to make us aware that... Um, of the existence of these hazards, of their risks, and of the need for the museum to really, um, uh, you know, develop a, a safe framework around this. So it was particularly, we, we, yeah, we started to become educated um, with, cons especially by conservatives around that time. Coming. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Kaz. Um, I've got two more questions online. They're fairly specific sort of questions. One is, has the museum ever found picric acid in a pharmaceutical collection? And if so, what did you do? <laughs> the answer is yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> and um, we um, cordoned off the area to keep staff uh, safe and away from it. And we brought in some expert people who deal with um, explosive compounds and they handled the material. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it did have to be deaccessioned and removed from the collection. But we left that to people who were very experienced in handling explosive compounds. We've also dealt with um, the defence force um because we have an arms collection which has uh, munitions in it and so we've consulted with them on a few similar instances so yes ex external help required and it was wasn't it the picric acid where we had to get a car a special um disposal unit from new south wales mm. come to victoria pick up the jar of picric acid and take it back to um New South Wales and detonate it, and it cost it cost a lot of money. The the, 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 um, the the you know the the some of this really costs to treat. I've got one one more question, which is: How is the uranium glass cake stand that appeared in one of the photos stored and handled? <laughs> Just butt in if I miss something. Um, well, firstly, the things that we have, uh, certainly in the his history and technology collection, they're not they're not like super radioactive. We're not going to turn into Spider Man or anything exciting like that. So um, it's largely about knowing it's there, um, having a barrier, which in this case for us is a is just a one of our storage cabinets, and it's a proximity thing. So. Um, that one, I believe the levels that we've measured, they're not they're not high enough that we have to take any special precautions, but we have another cabinet, for instance, where um, we, if someone wants to access it, we will um, we will open it and and sort of and, and vent the cabinet. Yeah, yeah, yeah before, before a certain period of time bef before we access it. Mm. So it's um it's that kind of thing. Does that answer it properly? I also mm. want to say about that cake stand. 
I'm going to have to go and have another look at it because I want to know how you actually put cake on it. Like it looks like <laughs> it has a V in the middle. It just doesn't it's, look very it's functional. The tiny little cakes. Uh, Mini cakes. Yeah, Mini cup cakes. Cake. Yeah. A yeah. single cupcake. We, we also label our um, storage cabinets with um, radioactive signs and warning symbols so that um, people don't accidentally go and open a cabinet that contains these items without um, prior warning. Um, yeah, and the items are labelled and and contained in their own containers as well. In case of the cake stand, yeah. There is a question over there. Um, I can imagine that, like when you're handling things with paint and those kind of things, you're probably suspecting that there's lead or something, but have there been any items that have been a real shock to you that have had hazardous substances and you're like, why on earth is that there? <laughs> well, I, I can talk about a recent um, item I was asked to look at actually um, to assess how, how much the pigments used on the item would fade. And... Um, when I looked at it, the item was a doll and um, a very beautiful bridal doll, quite a large one. And um, the um, waistband of the doll was decorated with flowers and green leaves. And um, I'd been doing some work and um, some reading up on some of the early arsenic pigments, um, in particular emerald green. And uh, when I looked at this, it was the exact colour of emerald green. So I quickly XRF'd the leaf. And in fact, it was emerald green pigment that had been used to um, colour the leaf on this particular doll. So that was one of the really, I think, more unusual items in the collection where I really didn't expect to find a hazard. So you so really don't want to find them on dolls that you know somebody has <laughs> played with in the past you know yeah um i had another question sort of going back to what someone asked about the acquisitions and but also like the scheduling how does it work if whether someone's learning something or it's like a you know traveling exhibition or an international acquisition if there's if something's already been identified as you know being a certain level level schedule or whatever their equivalent is overseas does that complicate like the actual physical like traveling from like one country to the next or is it only once it arrives that you know as long as both sides have the right certificates yes, yes. um that is something we have to be aware of when we're doing anything internationally uh fortunately um lots of the sort of health and safety like they're, they're global, you know, um, the dangerous goods uh, classification system um, and lots of the transport codes are fairly consistent from country to country. So um, we do have to check that on the the, um, the sender's end and the receiver's end and then the various contractors in between. Um, I don't think we have had anything where it's been terribly complicated, but you know, there sometimes might be late again labeling and just making sure that everyone involved is is aware of um, any dangerous goods that are involved. Is that that's what yeah, you think? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I've been told that we need to end it now. Um, so thank you very much to all the speakers and to the organisers, Moya, um, Kate, and Kaz McLennan, who helped organise it and pass the microphone around, um, and to Reese and Alan, uh, our technical people, and all, all others behind the scenes who make this series possible. And thank you very much for attending. <laughs> <laughs>